talk about Lake Erie, but really I could be talking about any number of other places as well, freshwater systems. Um, <clears throat> certainly Green Bay and Saginaw Bay would be areas that have similar kinds of problems, and there are uh, many inland lakes which are showing apparently increased uh, tendencies to, to have serious algal, algal bloom problems in the summertime and so forth. Many of these inland lakes don't have the problem of hypoxia because they're not deep enough to, uh, to stratify, and I'll explain what that means in a minute, but they do have problems with uh, excess of algal growth due to excess of nutrients. Some of you have hair about the color of mine. I may remember back in 1969 when the Cuyahoga River caught on fire uh, yet again. Uh, it turned out it was very hard to find a picture of this because it was so common that they didn't bother to send anybody out from the newspaper to, to cover the story. But in, in 1969, the Cuyahoga River caught on fire. It wasn't the river itself, of course, but it was the oil and stuff like that floating on the surface that burned, did minor damage to a railroad bridge and so forth. But it happened to be just the right time to catch the public's attention, and it was a major uh, sort of tipping point for the, for the beginnings of the environmental movement and the attempts to clean up Lake Erie. Um, somebody posted this kind of cute sign that says, the Cuyahoga River is flammable. Um, and, and by some, some magic of journalistic uh, logic, people concluded from this that Lake Erie was dead, which was really far from the, the case, but this, this was sort of the the, 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 uh, the, the spokesperson or the, the, uh, the magic button, I guess, that got things going. Um, so Lake Erie was, in, in fact, dead, but it had a number of problems at that time, including a number of contaminants in harbors and bays, the oils and greases and metals and organic chemicals and so forth. Um, the open lake had contamination from mercury and PCBs and DDT and, D and its derivative products in the fish and in, in the sediment. Um, there were a number of problems with invasive species, including the lampreys, that, which were destroying the lake trout and uh, whitefish and so forth. Eelwives, which used to wash up on the beaches in, in big piles in the springtime and, and rot, and certainly were an aesthetic problem with nothing else. And cladophora and algae that would do the same thing. Um, over, overfishing led to the demise of something called the blue pike, which some of you may remember was a popular uh, fish related to walleyes, but that particular strain was uh, just fished out, and the walleye population was seriously down and so forth. Um, the mayflies, which we now enjoy crunching on the sidewalks in the spring when they pile up under the street lights, were gone, or essentially gone, uh, having been decimated in the, in the, I guess, the 50s by a low oxygen period in the Western Basin primarily. But clearly the big problem was this problem of anoxia. And every summer in the Central Basin, the oxygen would get used up and uh, that would at least force the fish to live in a less than ideal temper, temperature zone or, or go to somewhere else in the lake, uh, would kill whatever happened to be living in the bottom waters and wasn't able to swim away, such as some of the insects and things that live in the sediment. Um, lake Erie is kind of an interesting lake and, and a unique lake, and there's some aspects about it that create this problem. It has three main basins. The western basin is in the west. It's shallow. It's uh, windy. So it generally does not have any problems with, with lack of oxygen. It's kind of muddy and so forth. The central basin is where we have this problem with, with anoxia, and that is because it's deep enough that in the summertime, a, a, a Two, two layer structures set up where the bottom waters are cold, the top waters are warm, they're separated by a transition zone. If you've ever dived down into a, a, a deep pond, you go through this cold, sudden change in temperature. That's what it is in the lake, but it's at about 60 feet. And because the, those two water masses are separated by temperature and by density differences, whatever's in the bottom when that thermal stratification sets up, lasts until late September or October when the top cools off and things turn over again. So in particular, the bottom water has to go through all, all the summer with whatever oxygen it had in it when the, the stratification sets up in, say, June or, or, or late May, perhaps. Uh, and the bottom water, which is called the hypolimnion, is, is quite thin just because of the natural geometry of the lake. So it doesn't have a very big volume of oxygen to get it through the summertime. In a sense, it's just a really badly designed lake. Uh, 
Um, the, the problem becomes worse because when you have excess algae, they, they sink to the bottom as they die, they go get into that bottom water, and bacteria down there then caught the de decay the algae and cause the oxygen to be used up. So it's a combination of if you have too many nutrients and too much algae and not enough oxygen because of the shallow hypolumnion, then you're, you're bound to have trouble. The eastern basin is much deeper, and while it does stratify, it doesn't have this problem because it has such a bigger volume to start with that it can get through the, the summer without any trouble. So that's why we have a problem. But the, the fact is that in the, uh, well, in say the 50s and 60s, this problem was getting worse on a pretty regular basis. It fluctuates from year to year just depending on weather conditions and a lot of details, but it was getting steadily worse over this period of time, as Don pointed out. I graphed that slightly differently. And the, when people decided, well, we've got to try to fix this lake, uh, there are a number of things they did, but the first thing they did was to, to decide, or the strategy was to make phosphorus the limiting nutrient, i.e., you'd use up the phosphorus, and because the algae needed more phosphorus to continue growing, they'd stop growing. If you've cut down the phosphorus, you can cut down the amount of algae. Uh, so all kinds of things were done to try to reduce the amount of phosphorus going into the lake. Um, Certainly, one of the major things was a ban on, on phosphorus and laundry detergents in, in the, the Lake Erie uh, watershed. And this cut down a major source of input. Um, not, not many people realize it, but that ban actually only applies to laundry detergent. It does not apply to dishwasher detergent. And there's a point of contention now about whether it should be applied to dishwasher detergent as well. Uh, major money was put into upgrading sewage treatment plants to remove more phosphorus from their effluent and keep it from going into the rivers and thence into the, into the lake or by direct, uh, direct outfalls into the lake. But they also quickly realized that point source controls weren't going to do the job. They're going to have to do some things with non-point source controls as, as well. And so there's a real push toward improved fertilizer and manure management of various sorts um, and a lot of effort at no-till and other programs which would reduce erosion and therefore reduce the amount of phosphorus going into the lake attached to the sediment that was eroded from the land. We actually saw fairly quick responses in the concentrations of materials in the tributaries. Here's a graph of the, the Maumee and Sandusky Rivers in northern Ohio. Um, but you can see that the sed sediment concentrations went down uh, fairly quickly, not necessarily uniformly, but substantial decreases over a period of uh, roughly 20 years. Uh, the total phosphorus content of those sediments or of the water also similarly went down. And there's something called dissolved reactive phosphorus, which is basically the main idea is it's phosphorus is actually dissolved in the water rather than attached to sediment. That similarly went down actually by an even greater percentage. You can see it's dropped down probably by almost 75 or 80 percent over this period of time. And that's a very good thing because the dissolved reactive phosphorus is a form that is very readily available to the algae to grow. So it's the, it's the part of the overall phosphorus that you'd most like to decrease if you want to de uh, decrease the amount of algae that grow. As Don mentioned, the, the total loads of phosphorus going into the lake uh, declined steadily. Um, the blue horizontal line was the target they set, 11,000 metric tons is the amount that would be adequate to control the problem uh, over the long term. And you can see that about, about, by about the early 80s, that was being met most of the time. The differences from year to year are just a function of when it rains and how much and that kind of thing. But we, we did what we said we wanted to do uh, and have maintained that since then. So here's the way things responded. Um, and I'm just obviously showing the first, first parts of graphs at this point. But the, the amount of phosphorus actually in the water in Lake Erie in the springtime when everything's turned over and uniform uh, dropped quite steadily from, whoops, I just did it, from whatever that was, 1983 to 1991 or so. Um, the oxygen depletion rate is, what, is the rate at which the oxygen is being used up in that bottom water by the, the seeding of algae in there and so forth. So we'd like to see that go down. The, the slower it gets used up, the longer it's going to last. And in fact, it went down quite dramatically over this period of time. Um, and this is the slide that Don showed. 
the, the uh, extent of anoxia in the central basin was decreasing in, in similar fashion. So it looked like we were doing a really good job not only of reducing the inputs, but we're getting the effects we wanted from it. And, and this was a very, nice, a very nice success story. But then it happened, the return of the dead zone. And so um, starting somewhere in the, the 90s, it's hard to pin down an exact starting point for these things, but starting about somewhere in the 90s, uh, the central basin anoxia extent increased again and still appears to be increasing. There's about a 10-year period there where I had uh, data missing from EPA. Apparently there is data, but they hadn't analyzed it, so I don't know exactly what was happening during that period of time. Uh, there's also a change in their method of calculation during that period of time, so how these numbers match up left side and right side is a little bit unclear, but certainly the, the anoxia problem is back again. Um, if we look at the tributary tens, trends up through about 2008, you see that on the upper left that we had an increase in just the amount of water going through the system uh, for about a seven year period from 2000 on, and that doesn't help anything because the more, more water you've got going through, the more it can carry. And consequently, the, the particulate phosphorus loads, the part that are attached to the sediment, also went up during that period of time. But what really happened, and what really is the killer, is that the dissolved phosphorus, which had been coming down so nicely, all of a sudden started taking off again and, and re reached levels that it hadn't even been at in the 70s. So it went from, bad, uh, from good to, to a lot worse. And as a consequence of these different directions of motion, uh, the percentage of the total phosphorus going through this, the uh, tributaries that was actually in that readily available dissolved form uh, also went up quite drastically. And the lake responded in a similar fashion. Here's the, the full graph for the central basin total phosphorus uh, picture. And since about 1993, it's been increasing steadily over this whole period of time. Uh, the oxygen depletion rate, which we'd like to have below, has been increasing again. And we don't know exactly where it's going in the future, but we're certainly concerned about it. So we've seen this whole system turn around in terms of what it seems to be showing us in its response to the environment. At the same time, as Don indicated, you know, we have a situation where officially we're doing what we said we needed to do in terms of the inputs. The loads have not increased, but the lake is acting like they did, as we've seen in these various graphs. So what in the Dickens is going on here? Um, I think that what's going on here is this particular thing this increase in the dissolved phosphorus. And I'll try to explain why that is likely to be so in the next few minutes. Particularly, why has it shifted up so strongly in this last period of time when the total amount of phosphorus hasn't changed? You're changing the proportions. Um, since this stuff is so readily available to the algae, you do much more damage by increasing this by 50% than you would by increasing the total phosphorus by 50%. We know one of the fact, well certainly we know that, that point sources have continued to improve or certainly haven't worsened. We know that 85% of these watersheds are used for agricultural purposes and it almost has to be a foregone conclusion that there's something within the agricultural system that's a major part of our problem here. Maybe not the whole thing, but a major part. This is the phosphorus equivalent of the nanny that um, Don showed showing the, the net amount of phosphorus going into these going into and coming out of these watersheds over a long period of time. And what really is interesting is that the, the, the Maumee and Sandusky, I don't have a pointer, but the, the Maumee is the biggest watershed there on the lower left of each graph. And the Sandusky is like two over from it. Um, in the 60s and 70s, there was a lot of excess phosphorus going onto the landscape, much more than was being removed through crops or through or running downstream. Um, and then as time went on, as you get into the late 80s and the 90s, things actually got much closer to being in balance. That there was not as much of an excess being applied as uh, previously. But the point is that there was always more phosphorus going onto the watershed than coming off. And if you do that, it's got to build up in the soil. No nothing else can happen to it. Unlike nitrogen, it doesn't go off into the atmosphere. So when we look at soil test data, we see that over this period of time, up until at least about 1995, 
this, this average soil test values on the, on the fields has, have gradually been going up. They've probably gone up by a factor of something like five times over the period of time since the 1960s. Since about 1995, it looks like things have kind of leveled off and maybe even gone down a little bit. But certainly, if you have more phosphorus in the soil, you have more opportunity to, for phosphorus to be removed from the soil and washed downstream. Because that has leveled off in the last period of time, about the same period of time we saw the increase in the dissolved phosphorus, we think this is kind of a secondary factor, but we're concerned about it nonetheless. Um, this is a, a graph where I'm trying to show each, each dot on the curve represents a different soil phosphorus analysis. And the vertical lines have look like they've lost their labels, but uh, the blue lines represent sort of the ideal agronomic fertility range for growing corn and soybeans. And the red lines represent the ideal range for growing wheat. It takes a little bit more phosphorus for wheat. But what we can see is that while there are some fields that are way above those critical levels, uh, most of them are not. And in fact, um, something like, if you consider wheat, something like 50% of the fields in these watersheds are still in the range where they would say, well, you should be building up your soil fertility. So just the basic level of fertility in the soil doesn't seem to be really the explanation of what's going on here. One of the things that we know, though, is that phosphorus tends to accumulate at the surface of the soil profile. When we do a standard soil test, it's an eight-inch core, and you homogenize it and, and measure the level. If you take just the top two inches instead and measure the phosphorus content in them, it's going to be higher. And, and this is a graph that shows that relationship. And I guess, again, I've lost my axes here. This happens when you use different computers and things. Um, but the, the horizontal axis is the... Uh, the, the phosphorus content in the standard 8-inch uh, so soil core and the vertical axis is the concentration, the phosphorus concentration in the upper 2 inches. And you can see that the, um, you can see if there were numbers on the axis, uh, that the, the phosphorus in the, in the upper portion of the, the soil core is often one and a half times or even more, two, two or three times as, as concentrated as it is throughout the whole soil, soil profile. This is important because when rain hits the soil, it only interacts with about the top inch or so. So it's really that first inch or two that's critical in determining the potential for losing phosphorus from the soil profile. When we look at a, a, a standard agronomic uh, soil analysis, it doesn't reflect that adequately. Um, so what we, what we have seen in looking at a number of different soils is that the, the soils at the surface are often about one and a half times what the, what the whole profile would, would give you. And uh, some, some models that we've run suggest that this stratification of the soil phosphorus uh, could account for something like the 50% of, of the increase of uh, dissolved phosphorus that we've seen. So stratification is a factor. Stratification can come from a number of sources, um, but I didn't list them, I guess. But there is a concern about no-till as a source of stratification because you're not turning over the soil anymore. So there's a kind of a trade-off, or there may be a kind of a trade-off between the erosion benefits of no-till and this problem of stratification of the phosphorus in the soil. On top of that, whenever you have plant matter that decays on, on the soil, um, that released nutrients go right onto the surface. They don't go throughout the whole column. So there's a tendency for, for soils to become stratified sort of spontaneously anyway. But a, an additional factor we think is very important is that over the past few years there's been an increasing tendency to apply the fertilizer in the fall, if at all possible, because people are eager to get on and get their crops planted as soon as possible in the spring. So the effort is, you know, get the stuff on, the, on, on in the fall and then we, we'd be ready to go in the spring. Because of pressures of time, these fertilizers are often not incorporated. They're broadcast on the surface and wind up just being left to sit. On top of that, we've had a tendency toward warmer winters, which means that we get more, more uh, rain and less snow, uh, less frozen ground. How the frozen ground comes out, plus or minus, is a little hard to say. But certainly, if you have a lot of rain instead of a lot of snow, you just have much more opportunity to dissolve that fertilizer and wash it away before it ever gets into the soil and gets equilibrated with the soil. We now see a situation where 50%, more than 50% of the total amount of dissolved phosphorus that we lose in a, in a year takes place in the three months, uh, December, January, and February. So it's a very imbalanced uh, pattern of loss. Uh, 
So what can we do about this? Um, it's easy to make suggestions, and I know that each one of these has its drawbacks, but they're worth considering anyway. Certainly, it's important to know your fertil fertility levels and not apply phosphorus that you don't need. Um, and this is the one I always kind of have to laugh about. They always say, well, don't, don't apply fertilizer before it's going to rain. Well, who knows? You know, if, we knew, if we all knew that, we could always we could manage this thing beautifully. But we can at least make an effort to avoid putting fertilizer out just before rainfall events. Um, there's some really interesting things being done with yield maps and, and precision application to fields where you only put the phosphorus where it's really needed or the fertilizer where it's really needed. Where it's possible, I think fertilizing in the spring is, a, is an ideal thing because it saves six months of just potential loss from interaction with the weather. And again, wherever possible, the fertilizer should be incorpor incorporated in the soil and not just left on the surface. Frozen ground is a no-no, as everybody knows. And the idea of winter cover crops is an attractive one, although I know it's very difficult to get them on soon enough to get enough growth to do much good, but where possible, they can really trap those nutrients and avoid them leaving the fields. I think it's useful to look at this from the standpoint of lost resources rather than just impact on external environments. Uh, we looked at the amount of nutrients that were lost from the Maumee watershed, that big watershed in 2007, which was a, a wet year. Uh, but we lost 3,500 tons of phosphorus and almost 30,000 tons of nitrogen from, from that watershed in that year. And if you look at what it would cost to replace that at the price of fertilizer in 2008, we're talking about 9 million bucks for phosphorus and, and almost 60 million bucks for nitrogen. Uh, and if you then try to do some guesstimates about what percentage of the watershed actually gets fertilizer applied to it and so forth, that comes out to about 62 bucks an acre. That's a, a pretty big hit to take for something that perhaps could be avoided. So finally, to try to look in the future a little bit, it's the, the crystal ball is definitely murky, but uh, climate change projections suggest we're likely to have more intense rainfall more frequently in the, in the future. That's likely to lead to increased erosion uh, and loss of nutrients attached to the soil unless we do an even better job of, of protecting the surface through, through no-till and so forth. And I think the other factor that may be important is if the, war if the win winters are in fact warmer, we have more trouble keeping nutrients on the ground during that period of time if they're put out in the fall. So just further incentive to, to uh, look toward changing these practices wherever possible. So I guess I'd have to say if we don't do something, things are likely to get worse rather than better. And I think I go back to Don at this point for some <laughs> concluding comments. He's going to make sense of all of this. <laughs>